Hello, Hello everyone. Welcome to my channel. My name is Rosa. So welcome to this to uh, video soon. where well. the pub. Thank you for attending this meeting that started off by an internet campaign of graduated students in the Netherlands. Parja Poon started a Facebook group that has now almost 600 subscribers. Amy Azar is also one of the active members and she's here today. Welcome, Amy. You will share your concerns about the current corona pandemic and its consequences to the students, talented surgeons and highly skilled migrants. Also, I invited Professor Tessa de Lange, who is an expert on labor and knowledge migration at the Radboud University in Nijmegen. And next, for more practical insights, I asked two befriended immigration attorneys, Mandy Janssen and Thomas van Houdingen, to comment on the situation and perhaps give us some ready-to-use recipes for legal workarounds. I'm Julian de Skure, also an attorney working in Rotterdam and happy to host this meeting. Or must I say first, unhappy that this is necessary uh, to organize this conference in this difficult time for everyone and even more for foreign talent and contributors in the Netherlands to the Dutch society. And now many of you are now watching. Welcome to this broadcast and let's find some answers. Amy, can you first tell us how this has affected you personally? I have graduated from Leiden University in 2019 and uh, since that time personally I have been trying to find a job myself in the legal domain because that's my specification. Um, however, even before it started, uh, I had this um, problem that mainly the job market was not really welcoming to me. It could have been due to language barriers, it could have been due to different experiences, different uh, culture in the work atmosphere. Um, however, after the pandemic, we faced a new issue, which was uh, not only about the differences in the um, culture and the applicants, but also a new phenomenon by which the applications are being on hold. Of course, by the requirements of IND, there are some privileges for us as the graduates of the Netherlands, and there are some obstacles or some more difficulties on us. Uh, if the, of course, during our search year, we are allowed to work 40 hours per uh, week, and there is no restriction with regard to our salary scheme as long as we are in the search year and of course we can be hired even let's say the supermarket however most of the problems start from the time that we want to extend our visas and that's the concern of most of the members of our group and uh, specifically you know during this time that if they want to be hired, first of all, there should be a recognized sponsor. And uh, by you know studying the law of IND, we we'll understand that they are in two categories. Either they are those academic institutions like the universities, or they are, for example, other companies that will hire uh, highly skilled migrants. It is an interesting fact that although those recognized sponsors have been through a um, process to receive that sponsorship, they still are not quite familiar with the process of hiring graduates in ZOTR and after the expiration date of ZOTR visa. Mm -hmm. And all of those uh, problems brought us to um, conclude that re it's not really possible within this time frame that we have to be employed and to extend our visa. And uh, this is just, you know, one aspect of the many problems that we are facing these days. 
Can you give an indication of how many people like you are similarly affected? We have reached to a number of 700 uh, people who have the share uh, concern. And I assume um, it's just the very beginning of, uh, let's say, this collective uh, mission. We also have the students who, as mm. you mentioned, are uh, in uncertainty and insecurity about how to uh, go through the study progress and how to continue their education. And of course, after the graduation, it could be possible that they will have the yeah. same concern with us. Thomas, you are working at one of the major immigration law firms in the Netherlands and specialized in knowledge immigration. In these turbulent and insecure times, did you notice the distress in your inbox or on a telephone? Well, yes, we we were actually, as per the, when the when the intelligent lockdown started, uh, we were actually quite swamped by questions like, uh, well, Amy was just addressing, but also others, uh, not only. Uh, students or researchers, but also uh, people who are self-employed. And I think the sort of mm -hmm. broader picture is that these times, these pandemic times are already quite confusing, even well, well, for anyone in the Netherlands. But being uh, here on a residence permit and being dependent on, on universities and employers makes it even more confusing because well, there have been introduced all kinds of ad hoc measures, particular measures for migrants. It's just all, um, the INU website is just mentioning leniency, which is well, so vague that people call us and ask, well, what does that mean? What does working on returning mean? And when will they be lenient? And when they will, when will they, will they, will they not be lenient? So, well, I certainly recognize uh, what Amy is addressing, and, and I think it's definitely a good idea that 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 we try to do something about that. Mm -hmm. Professor Tessuch de Lange, you have done research under these groups of talented workers. On the internet, many of them have organized themselves, but I have the feeling we are now just seeing the top of the iceberg. How many foreign students and young professionals are we talking about? We didn't ask that in advance, but there is a, a, a study done by the European Migration Network, which was finished last November, and I think we can put some of the numbers uh, on a slide uh, right mm -hmm. after that question um, for people to see, but we're talking about thousands of people. Um, international student migration uh, has been big business globally and is big business for Dutch higher education institutions as well. Um, uh, not just for the Netherlands, we're talking also Europe. Um, uh, the European Union has specific legislation for students and also recently implemented the, the search year or at least search nine months at an at a EU level. So um, you're not alone, um, uh, Amy, in, in the Netherlands. There must be people in, in, in Germany, in France, in Belgium, like you, struggling um, to to uh, find their way through this search period that has gone um, yeah into into thin air. Amy, I really liked your your remark that you're actually building a new home here, and I think that is um, uh, something. If you look at at the the debates on the orientation year or the search year on on um, uh, attracting international students into talent um, the idea that you are creating a new home for yourselves in uh, the receiving country is not that prominent the idea is that highly skilled migrants are moving on that you you keep that the world is your play guard <laughs> and uh, you're a global citizen and you'll be here to pick the cherries that you like but you'll move on if necessary and I guess that is one of the very difficult things you're up against the idea you're you're well trained uh, you must have had some money somewhere in your life to be able to to make this move. So in that sense, you're up against a prejudice that you're not um, uh, to be pitied or otherwise. So um, I think in, in your approach to the theme, 
it's good to realize what you're up against. And um, that's good that, I mean, you're a lawyer, you're, you're talking to lawyers to think of what is a real um, honest legal strategy. Um, and I um, agree with what, what um, uh, Thomas was just saying you know, about this lenience, that is vague legal terminology. And I guess asking for more precision on what exactly is um, uh, meant by it, um, uh, that, that, that is um, a justified. Mandy Janssen is an attorney at the firm mainly counseling companies and employers in complex immigration matters. From that perspective, Mandy, did you notice increased interest or distress at your clients? that um, normally the phone was ringing for we want people we want people we want people and now the phone is ringing okay we have people but due to the COVID-19 pandemic we actually cannot afford them anymore because we have liquidity problems how can we still make sure that they can either stay or how can we make sure that they can move along or mm -hmm. even get fired and um, so normally it was really uh, the market was, I want people, I want them here, I want the knowledge to be here, and I don't want them to go. And now it's more leans to, I need them to go because we can't afford them anymore. And the companies in the Netherlands don't want people to go because we are a knowledge market based economy in the Netherlands. And we need these people who studied in the Netherlands here. Mm. Not only because of the fact that the salary criteria for knowledge markets are, for some uh, educations, quite steep. So once somebody has studied here or has graduated from a top 200 university and has a residence permit for search year here, they are much more interesting for the companies in the Netherlands and also mm -hmm. very good for our economy. But what is happening now is we cannot build on the economy because it's breaking down. Amy, together with the others, you have started a lobby towards educational institutes and even Dutch Parliament. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? But if we are going to consider this pandemic as one of those um, manifestations of force majeure, we can convince the parliament and the government to provide us with an extension of our visas so that not only the Dutch employers or international companies can have better facilities to hire us because they won't have to go through all those uh, legal procedures because we already have a valid work permit. But also, um, we can still, you know, contribute with that reduced salary scheme. And this is also, you know, beneficial for us because it was the goal with which we entered this country. five of us, we know how relevant and important this group of talented churchers and professionals is to the Dutch economy. And of course, we can voice that and share our sympathy in society. But perhaps it's more effective to stay in our own ballpark as lawyers. So what are the legal answers to this current insecurity? What we know is that the provision in the Alien Act degree that covers the situation of surgers explicitly restricts the immigration office so that the visa cannot be extended after one year. Legislation must be amended first and approved by Parliament, which can take up many months. Or is there any other option, Amandi? Um, yeah, of course, the law itself is strict, but I've known the Immigration Naturalization Service for a while, and if they really want to, they can let us color outside the lines. I mean, they mm -hmm. made someone a recognized sponsor who officially did not comply with the requirements because the lawmaker in the Netherlands forgot that part of government does not comply with the requirements. And then they can do, well, then they can actually stretch the lines of the law. So yes, it is strictly stated that it's not possible, but that doesn't mean it's not possible. The same with, for example, in the, um, there is a possibility for a work permit, uh, which is only uh, possible to get for what was it, 24 weeks practitioner. Uh, so sort of le uh, learning on the job, but if you substantiate that quite well, you can also get it for a longer duration of time. So just the fact that it's stated that it's not possible does not mean it's not possible.
to my opinion, though. Yep. Do you yeah. agree on that, Thomas? Yeah, in addition to that, well, I, I do agree that, and I, I really like the phrase, uh, the fact that it's not possible doesn't mean it's not possible. Or <laughs> I, I really like that that wording. But um, well, what I would recommend, let's say a search your visa expires tomorrow and you don't know what to do, I would always say make some sort of application to either convert the permit, uh, maybe even make an extension application, uh, even though it's not possible legally, because pending such an application the, there will be legal residents, what we call procedural legal residents, and at least that creates um, uh, uh, well, legal residents, and also it will not lead to a residence gap per se uh, uh, under, for example, the rules of, of um, uh, for the long-term resident of the EU permit, the permanent residence permit. Not, unfortunately, not for citizenship. But I would always recommend to have something in the air at the IND to make sure that the, the, the residency is still there, albeit not on a physical card, but, but procedurally. Thomas, I second your suggestion to file an application anyway, no matter if you cannot meet the requirements. Um, we have to talk through the details, of course, but at least this will offer the applicant some injury time, as I call it. New developments can occur and the requirements can be met later in the procedure, even during an administrative appeal, or the IND will offer some leniency. So doing nothing and wait is not an option. And even better it would be when uh, as many affected persons would apply for this professional visa, huge numbers will alarm the immigration office and may trigger the policy makers to offer alternatives. I would like to prepare do-it-yourself kits that can be downloaded from the website and be filed by the foreign national himself. Not only searchers are at risk, but also foreign employees, mostly highly skilled migrants, um, who are now given notice and lose their job. They too better make sure that they will apply for an extension, even th there is not yet uh, a job in sight. Do you agree, Mandy? Uh, initially, it's actually the same advice as Thomas and you just uh, iterated with regard to uh, just apply for any permit in order to make sure that you have sort of a, an extra time to find a new job. And otherwise, try your luck at payroll companies who are recognized as sponsors, because the best part of being a knowledge migrant is that you can be seconded to other parties quite easily. Um, the only thing that you need to take into account then is officially, once you are a knowledge migrant, you can, of course, work for several recognized sponsors. But then with each of those sponsors, you need to completely fulfill all the requirements. So once the salary criterion is uh, applicable with that recognized sponsor, if you also work for another recognized sponsor, for both of them, you will have to earn at least the entire salary criterion, regardless if you work pro rata there. But if you work for a payroll company, that payroll company is the recognized sponsor. That payroll company therefore pays your wages. They make sure that you comply with the salary criterion. They are, however, allowed to second you to an, one company, two companies, or three companies. And the fact that you there work 20 hours, 10 hours, and 10 hours, you still get paid by one formal employer by one recognized sponsor and therewith you can comply. So that is a little bit something that you can play with, but I have to tell you then, make sure that the payroll company also takes into the account the labor times law in the, ne in the Netherlands, because that is something that the labor inspectorate of course can inspect. Just, yeah, just one ahead. thing that um, is often overlooked and I'm just, curious whether you work with that or, or what your uh, position is on that, um, uh, both um, uh, Julian, Mandy, Thomas, um, is um, that the highly skilled migrants, when, when they are working, and that's during the, the search year as well, um, they um, fall within the scope of the European Union single uh, permit directive. And um, Article 12 of that directive grants equal treatment 
for uh, working migrants for a, a couple of um, uh, things uh, with regard to their labor rights, with regard to the assistance of labor authorities with finding work. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, there's a huge organization being set up for uh, Dutch people uh, to, to find jobs in, in sectors that they weren't aware that they were there because their sector doesn't exist anymore. So people need to be flexible and move into different kind of jobs. I've suggested to them that they would also include in their services the highly skilled and the searchier people. And they weren't actually that negative about that idea, uh, especially because uh, the high skills, maybe high IT skills available as well, um, could be of, of uh, relevance to essential uh, business at the moment. Um, so that could also be um, uh, right at this moment, a way uh, uh, to go and to contact them and to see what kind mm. of services they can offer. Uh, and I would say under the single PERMA directive, there is actually an entitlement to those services. Thomas, how about the situation where the current employer cannot comply with the salary conditions for highly skilled migrants and suspends the payments? Can the immigration office cancel the residence permit and what will happen next? If permits of highly skilled migrants should be withdrawn due to the fact that the, the income criteria wasn't met or weren't met, or uh, the, the, well, at some point not all conditions were met, then this retroactive withdrawal should also be in line with the principle of proportionality of uh, uh, EU law based on this single permit directive. And I think maybe in the slipstream of these, this pandemic, we will see cases about this, mat this, this matter and, 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 and we'll mm. be able to argue that the single permit directive Bars bars the immigration service from suddenly withdrawing permits in these force majeure situation. Uh, um, yeah, but so I would definitely say that the EU law can can help us lawyers to plead the case, but also, and that's the most important part, the individuals. What my experience is is that they, if they withdraw, they also just withdraw from the moment that it mm -hmm. the requirements were were not met until now and then yeah. you have to appeal to sort of mend the gap as much as possible but i would say that if a gap occurs outside of the 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 the, the, the highly skilled migrants sphere of influence such as this pandemic uh, but i've seen cases in the past of employers who had made a mistake uh, that the highly skilled migrant could not influence well well that's really something that that that, that would well, that would be would be uh, worth arguing, yeah. Uh, let's do some more practical aspects because what we are talking now is more specifically, you know, um, what is written within the law. But what we on the other side of the table are experiencing practically is totally different. Because first of all, there is no job now that you know we are uh, applying. There is not only now but also it's been predicted that we are going to have a huge unemployment so this is you know let's put it extreme that we really are going to have um job scarcity now all of it is if and if companies are willing to hire us and also a type of indirect um let's say indication of a hidden preference for the nationals. Um, we have seen cases in which um, possibly there was, uh, there were you know, a lot of candidates and um, we saw that, you know, for example, a candidate which was not a European was quite qualified for that job. And uh, he or she received this email that another candidate was prepared for it. And then we went through this and we all um, compared the job requirements with the application, with the CV of a candidate. We came to this conclusion that 
there is still this tendency, this hidden tendency for the nationals. Yeah. And this if can I, even make the situation worse for uh, non-Europeans. Yeah. If I may, may respond to that, uh, Amy, I think you're right. I mean, research um, uh, again and again shows that the Dutch labor market discriminates. Uh, against um, uh, people with a migration uh, migrant name um, uh, or look. Um, um, in that case, um, I think what would be good is if there's, and it's very difficult to prove, um, So, but nevertheless, if all internationals would complain with the um, uh, Dutch uh, uh, committee, um, uh, for complaints on uh, discrimination on the labor market. And I think in this, when we're talking about this in the uh, final um, uh, footing, we, we can give the little address, uh, Julia, where they can do that. Because there's very little people who complain about it. And mm -hmm. we found that people just don't know that this is an option, that you can complain about discrimination in application procedures. Um, uh, we have a legal procedure for that. So if even though a lot of cases fail, nevertheless, I would say file the complaint. And, and if the more there are complaints there are, again, it's been mentioned before, it gives a signal that there is a group in, in, in despair that society needs to pay attention to. Discrimination is absolutely nasty and underestimated problem, and especially in a job market. And I know it has the attention of the authorities and the Committee of Human Rights, but it will take a long time before employers do not pay any attention anymore to the candidate's name or background and start to take their business seriously and just pick the best man or woman on the job. to the current corona problems, this requires an immediate medicine for foreign professionals. So I reckon not only the, the immigration office, but also different responsible ministries and stakeholders must be made aware about their problems, like the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Social Affairs and Employment. And I hope these affected people are able to organize themselves in a more professional framework so that the lobby will be structured and continuing even after the pandemic. Um, I did like your summing up also of other ministries that might be relevant. Um, I would also say the Ministry of Education. Mm -hmm. um, you didn't mention them, but I think they were the ones who supported the higher educational institutions getting you in. You know, you, your, the, the, the tuition fees that you paid was part of their business uh, model. Um, uh, so, um, uh, sort of turning around to put your money where your mouth is, um, uh, uh, why aren't they stepping up for you guys saying, um, uh, we recruited them, yeah. we were happy that they were coming, and now they are our internationals and we need to, to be there for them. So that would also be a possible venue, um, uh, possibly through um, also the uh, VSNU, uh, the Association of Universities and NAFIC, the, the organization uh, also involved in international um, uh, student migration. Uh, so I, I, that would, so politically, I would also suggest to um, touch base with them and see mm. what they can do. Thank you, Tessica, and you're right. The, the students and searchers have all the right to demand something back, some, some sort of solidarity uh, from the institutes and organizations that have benefited from their investments in the Netherlands. I started off that I'm not happy, but I must admit the contributions from you all, and especially from you, Amy, that I'm at least very inspired to continue our quest and find solutions. Mandy Thomas and Hans of Kroos Advocaten, we will now develop legal strategies, and I'm sure Tessa will supply us with the helpful documentation. And in the meantime, Amy, we keep in touch on Facebook to advance this campaign. And um, there is already good news, I can tell you that, because a manager in the, in the IND picked up the bus on LinkedIn and Facebook and reached out to me. They are very aware of the issues and they are also very interested in our stories and feedback that was told in this video. 
So more news to follow soon. And thank you, Amy, Tessa, Jim, Mandy, and Thomas for your contributions. And to our viewers, I would like to say, this is just the beginning of something big. So stay healthy and stay tuned. Thanks.